Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Julie Watkins, and I'll be helping with today's travelogue brought to you by the Geographic Society of Chicago. Um, since 1898, the Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about geography and its important uses. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technology. Through services such as our community mapping projects, we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of GIS to solve environmental and community issues. Together, our board and membership provide education opportunities for students and educators, assist in building geographic materials collections in educational and cultural institutions, promote new and emerging technologies and problem solving, and much more. If you're familiar with our travelogue series, you know that normally we conduct, the, conduct these presentations in person each month at the Chicago Cultural Center. So we can't get together physically at the moment, but the GSC wanted to remain connected with its members and supporters. So we've turned our travelogue series into webinars, at least until we get back to a new state of normal. This is our, first, er, our fourth time doing a virtual travelogue, so please make sure to share any feedback you have. And with us today to present is uh, Patrick McBrady to present on Chicago River Bridges and their rich history from the first wood footbridge built by a tavern owner in 1832 to the engineering and architectural marvels spanning the river today. His talk today is based on his award-winning book of the same title and will reveal how Chicago became the drawbridge capital of the world. Um, so before we begin, let me note that we will have a question and answer period following uh, Patrick's presentation. So if you look at your screen, you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom. If there is any question that you have for Patrick, uh, go ahead and type uh, it into the chat window. And then following the presentation, we will answer as many questions as time allows. So with that, I will pass things over to Patrick. Thank you very much. And I think you are muted, Patrick. Oh yeah, that helps, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so thank you. Uh, I guess I probably should share my screen here. Give me just a second. And um, so here to talk about Chicago River Bridges. Uh, and if you notice from this image, this is not uh, a Chicago bridge. This is actually a Paris bridge. This is the Alexander III Bridge in Paris that was held up at the turn of the last century as the ideal bridge that Chicago bridges should look like um, and part of a city beautiful movement that was going on in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and uh, the actually Michigan Avenue bridge is uh, the bridge that is modeled uh, after this bridge here in Chicago. Let's see, I mean, a second. And so there's the Michigan Avenue Bridge, which was built in 1920. Uh, so for this, uh, today's travel log, we're not gonna travel that far. We're just gonna basically go up and down the Chicago River uh, and uh, talk about uh, the bridges, which is the book I did called Chicago River Bridges. Uh, and that came out in 2013. And that's available at most of the downtown museum shops. Uh, there was also a, com uh, a um, complimentary documentary that was a, like a sidekick to this project that I did with Stephen Hatch. And actually, if you go to my website that's there at the top, uh, pmcbrady.com and register, you can actually view this documentary for free, which is about 56 minutes. Um, I also did some children's picture books, but you've probably had enough uh, commercials. So when I do this talk, people will often ask, you know, why uh, Chicago drawbridges? And, what got me interested in this, in this. and it was uh, a bit of a hard one appreciation for the bridges. Uh, unfortunately, my wife died suddenly in uh, the fall of 1999, and that kind of changed what was going on my whole uh, life and was happening, and I knew I needed to get out and uh, take a look uh, at, at Chicago and actually borrowed a camera from my young sister uh, that we'd used in high school photography, and went and photographed the bridges. And I noticed they had this really magic, this magical element to them being drawbridges and probably playing with Tonka trucks as a kid uh, and a gritty aesthetic with the steel that was there. Uh, and also quickly discovered there was a fantastic untold history. Uh, some of the steel mill dust probably rubbed off. I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. 
And uh, when I was growing up, there was plenty of steel being produced in Youngstown still uh, until most of those mills have now shut down. And I also should have been an engineer. I found that after finishing a master's in economics that I, I took a career placement test and said, oh, wait, I probably should have studied engineering instead of uh, economics. And so that kind of engineer wannabe within me really resonated with the bridges and those uh, were interesting. And realized that moving to Chicago from growing up in the Midwest, uh, that I'd been placed right into the crucible for a lot of drawbridge uh, design and innovation that happened here in Chicago uh, before anywhere else on earth. So it was uh, pretty interesting. And as I said, I'd gotten that camera from my youngest sister and uh, I went to Kinsey Street on a kind of a blustery December Sunday morning and photographed the two bridges here and they seemed to beg a lot of questions. Uh, here's this uh, railroad bridge that uh, stands up in the air today at uh, near Kinsey Street that some people joke is the Viagra Bridge because it's always up. Uh, that has this counterweight on the back end uh, and then next to it is the street uh, crossing uh, over the north branch of the Chicago River there for Kinsey Street uh, which is both of these are single leaf bascule bridges and I'll talk a little bit about what a bascule bridge is in a little bit later but they look very different and do almost exactly the same thing. Uh, so that, as I said, begged a lot of questions and got me kind of interested that, you know, maybe there's something here and uh, besides just doing a little bit of photography, maybe there's a book idea. And so that got me interested and then I got busy with work and life and uh, had the chance uh, several years later to come back uh, and think about, you know, what am I doing? I took some time off from work and uh, settled back into thinking, well, I should probably do, maybe I could do a book on the bridges and realizing I couldn't go out with my friends as much and keep drinking like this and live as long as I wanted. And so the bridges kind of came into play. And then I also met uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Hatch, who the two of us, uh, we did, uh, we did a, uh, a doc oh, hang on a second. We did a documentary on Chicago drawbridges and I'll just play a short little clip from the documentary, as I said, is available through my, uh, registering at my author website. Chicago. In less than 200 years, Chicago rose from a swampy French and Indian trading post into a world-class city. The bridges have been a long part of comedy history, and not just part of our architectural design or the film about comedy itself. My name is Patrick Friary. And I used to not care about the bridges until one day a bridge got in my way. Researching the bridges, I found out Chicago was the drawbridge capital of the world. And that just really seemed to hook me. And now I can't look at a bridge the same way. So that, that's true. I, I, I can't look at a bridge the same way, and I hope by the end of this uh, doc, uh, this presentation, you won't uh, look at a bridge the same way either. Um, but uh, backing up into a larger context, uh, I just found in general bridges are, are fascinating. Uh, they're ancient creations. There were man-made bridges long before man ever thought of the idea, um, created by the wind and waves and, and water. And uh, then at some point, well before history was ever recorded, man uh, decided to make, its own, make our own bridges uh, by maybe throwing some rocks in, across a stream or felling a log and, and throwing that across to walk across and 
uh, stay dry and, and not potentially put yourself at risk. And then uh, they're also universal and utilitarian and so powerful. Uh, one bridge can then carry a, a numeral number of people back and forth uh, across a waterway or a chasm uh, to uh, encourage civilization, growth, and prosperity. Uh, and then uh, just the, the idea of that simple magic of walking through what used to be thin air uh, across some divide. Uh, Bridges are ubiquitous. Even the simplest forms of bridges are still in use today uh, and elemental to civilization and have uh, infected our language, customs, and relations. So I, I kind of uh, like to joke that bridges are maybe one of the first viral ideas uh, that ever came to be. And they're everywhere in every culture uh, all around the world and used throughout. And I will often present to kids uh, with my children's books and talk about bridges and explain how um, I live under a bridge and they'll give me a funny look oftentimes. Um, and uh, then I'll challenge them and say, well, I bet that you live under a bridge too. And of course, usually some kid will pop up and say, uh, get out of here, you're crazy. And uh, in fact, you know, basic building structure uh, or a table or a chair, a wall and a ceiling really form a bridge structure. And so bridges really are all over uh, and, and used in many different ways. And we have very specific bridges, uh, like say a, a piece of furniture, uh, a desk, a chair, that uh, are really a basic bridge structure. Uh, so that was kind of cool to kind of see that, uh, that, that go. And then going to Chicago, I found with some research that Chicago had the most drawbridges in North America. And uh, we currently have 57 railroad and highway uh, drawbridges. 37 are still operational, and those open in the spring and the fall for the lifts of the boats going out in the spring, uh, and then back to the boat yards in the fall. And uh, we had a peak of actually 73 bridges uh, in uh, 1960, and have lost a few since then that have been replaced, or on the north branch of the Chicago River, they now have uh, fixed bridges. So uh, in any event, uh, I also, we, when we first did the documentary, we showed it and we claimed Chicago had the most drawbridges. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dennis McClendon, who did a few maps in my book, uh, pulled me aside and said, Patrick, are you sure Chicago has the most drawbridges? What about uh, Vienna? What about Hamburg? What about Amsterdam? What about Chicago, uh, Pittsburgh? Uh, and so I went back and using Google Earth, uh, luckily I didn't have to, I mean, I could have traveled to all those places and the book would have been really expensive. Um, but found that Amsterdam actually has approximately 90 some bridges, draw bridges. Uh, and so we had to recut the film a little bit and fix it up uh, for currently now. So Chicago is the second uh, most draw bridges of any city in the world. And again, as I mentioned, those spring and fall openings on the Chicago River still happen. And then the bridges on the Calumet River, because there's enough commercial traffic, uh, and it's not also in the center of downtown, uh, that those bridges open on demand basically for uh, boats going in and out of the Calumet River down on the south side. And uh, the drawbridge capital of the world that we mentioned in the documentary, um, that, you know, when that kind of was a question of, well, how do we call ourselves that when Amsterdam has more drawbridges? And I went back to the US patents uh, and went through all the research from the the early uh, 1790s on up to the 2000s and determined that Chicago, uh, Chicagoans hold over 120 of the approximate 350 US patents on drawbridges. And of the Baskerville Bridge patents, which there are about 120 uh, since US patents have been reported, 60% are held by Chicagoans or former Chicagoans. And uh, we have the most modern drawbridge designs, uh, most of the well, modern drawbridge designs, just to say, were invented, built, or first tested here in Chicago for anywhere else. So, uh, and we also have the greatest variety of different drawbridge designs when it comes to drawbridges or movable bridges. So people then ask kind of what, how does this, how does it happen? Uh, and it really goes back to the fact that the Chicago River is part of a historic waterway. Uh, it was one of a couple portages uh, that connect the Great Lakes watershed with the Mississippi watershed. Uh, 
Uh, and you can go all the way back to Marquette and Joliet and the early French explorers that came through uh, the Chicago area. And in fact, uh, I've also got a podcast we've done called Windy City Historians with Chris Lynch and have discovered that where there was a second Chicago portage down on the south side using the Calumet, uh, which actually may have been used by Marquette and Joliet. And that's been a bit controversial and some other history uh, that if you're interested in that podcast, you can go to Windy City Historians. And that's one of the projects I've been working on over the last year or two. Um, but this Y-shaped river of the Chicago River on the southwest shore of Michigan Avenue, or Lake Michigan, I should say, um, was uh, incremental to Native Americans as a way to reach uh, the Mississippi watershed and also connect with the Great Lakes. They used it for, for uh, hundreds of years, more like, most likely. And then early explorers, uh, where you could go over a fairly low divide and then connect uh, between the two. And Joliet even talks about that in his first uh, discovery through Chicago of uh, these portages could be uh, quickly replaced by a possible um, canal. And then, uh, of course, Chicago started to, uh, because that connect water connection uh, grew up with initially with Western uh, development in the United States coming in with Fort Dearborn in 1803, which lasted through the War of 1812 and then re later rebuilt. And then the city really kind of had this rapid growth from the 1830s on. Uh, it became a city in 1837. And then uh, decade to decade, uh, doubled or almost tripled in size uh, up into the early 1900s. Uh, and Chicago experienced the most rapid growth in history of any city uh, up until that point. Um, so uh, springing up from on this swampy prairie landscape, uh, that Chicago quickly went to about a million or more people by uh, near the turn of the century. And you, you combine that with then this busy waterway, which was a natural harbor for ships to come in and out of. You can see one of the swing bridges here in this image that uh, uh, Chicago connected us. And we had, of course, the i &M Canal or Illinois and Michigan Canal that was uh, connecting through locks uh, to the Illinois River from the Chicago River. Um, and uh, that we became a center for transshipment. And all this sitting on this flat prairie landscape uh, really meant that drawbridges were the best solution for Chicago. Uh, and you can see from this table that I put together, uh, as we go on the left side, the decade to decade, uh, you show the, see then the growth in population of Chicago as a city. And then the number of bridges on the Chicago River uh, of both drawbridges and fixed bridges that uh, sprung up then on the main and south branches as Chicago grew on the south side first and then expanded along the river and up onto the north branch where we needed more and more bridges to the point where we practically had a, a bridge at uh, about every block uh, crossing uh, the either the north, south, or main branch of the Chicago River. Uh, then Chicago itself has an interesting history in that these designs evolved over the, the say 150 years or so of Chicago's bridges. The very first bridge was in uh, 1832 and actually I, uh, it was occurred or was built uh, by a tavern owner uh, basically about where that railroad bridge at Kinsey Street was where I first did the photography uh, in 1832. And it was a way for him to potentially increase business, uh, but the bridge was free and open to all. The next, uh, the, well, the, the next milestone in Chicago, and there were two of those fixed bridges built first over the North Branch, and then later that winter or, uh, at, over the South Branch by another pair of tavern owners, um, whereas there was no government really to pay for bridges. And then the very first drawbridge was built at Dearborn Street connecting the north and south sides of the city. Um, and that was something also that was kind of interesting, not having grown up in Chicago. I grew up in, in uh, Ohio and, and Illinois in uh, Normal and then uh, Arkansas for a few years and then uh, Youngstown, Ohio. And coming to Chicago, people would refer to the north, south, and west sides of the city. And they never really made sense to me because it didn't match up at all with the grid pattern uh, with, you know, on the south side, uh, we have uh, Dearborn and Madison as our zero, zero mark. 
And I could not quite ever figure out until doing this research realized that the Chicago River, that Y in the middle of the city, uh, was really that original def definition of the north, south, and west sides of the city. And it only made sense that bridges would connect them. So this, this bridge um, that uh, was here at uh, Dearborn Street was um, basically similar to today's bridges. Uh, there was a, a block and tackle connecting to each end of the bridge. And a bridge tender then would uh, spool up that rope on a wooden drum on either shore uh, to then open or close the bridge for ships. Um, now, this bridge itself uh, was built by a shipwright, uh, Nelson R. Norton, uh, and it was may have taken from timber that was cut not too far from today's Michigan Avenue. And uh, after a few years, it became a little bit temperamental and also uh, needed a fair amount of maintenance. Uh, the city had come into play then, and people were petitioning the city to help maintain these bridges, and the cost was becoming uh, expensive. And so there was a bit of a political battle uh, between the North and South Siders on repairing this bridge. And it was decided that the bridge itself uh, would be uh, torn down. And uh, the uh, city was then was in a impasse uh, where that bridge was had been removed in 1839, uh, five uh, years after it had been built. And uh, the city council was deadlocked uh, on the ability to get another bridge built. Well, Walter Newberry, who was a North Shore, uh, our North Side uh, warehouseman, and Walter Newberry, who was the city's first mayor, uh, donated uh, two blocks to Catholic authorities in order to influence votes in the, in the city. And that got uh, the approval in 1840 for a, a new bridge on the north and south, connecting north and south sides at Clark Street. And interestingly enough, there's still remnants of that early deal and that rivalry between north and south siders uh, because the south siders wanted to stop all the wagon trade that was coming from the various agricultural and farms into Chicago to trade for the Eastern trade goods that would come through the Great Lakes in Chicago. And they figured if they removed the bridge, they would get all that trade for themselves. Um, so once it was agreed to, uh, and, uh, they donated the land, they influenced the votes uh, and in classic Chicago uh, politics. And so the first bridge then, uh, a pontoon float bridge of its kind, uh, was built at Clark Street to reconnect the north and south sides of the river. Uh, and uh, the remnants of those two blocks uh, are where Holy Name Cathedral stands today. Uh, so most people think that that rivalry of the North Siders versus South Siders goes back to baseball and the White Sox and the Cubs, but it really goes to that first Dearborn Street Bridge. Uh, this Clark, Clark Street Bridge was a unique design in that it had uh, four pins on each corner of the bridge. Uh, one was a pivot point. And, and the others would be pulled out by the bridge tenders. And then a line on either shore would allow you to pull this bridge from one side to the other. Uh, and you could then draw the bridge to the side. And that center section of the bridge is also called the draw. Uh, and also the act of opening it would be to draw the bridge. Uh, visualized, con visualized concepts came up with these uh, diagrams for us once they heard about the project and we got them interested in the documentary. So uh, that was very cool to be able to show how this how this worked to people in the in the film. Um, so after uh, that, uh, Chicago also then, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, this is kind of evolution of bridges. The railroads had come into Chicago in 1848. Uh, and so as the uh, bridges uh, got uh, you know, worn and the wood, of course, wasn't treated and be close to the water and the changing uh, temperature, they would deteriorate. Uh, they came up with a little better design where they used, incorporated the idea of a turntable from the railroads to make pontoon turntable swing bridges uh, after that. And then those eventually evolved into what were called the pivot or swing bridges, uh, the first of which was at Lake Street in 1852. This image is of uh, a bridge from 1857 at Clark Street that replaced uh, the previous bridge. And those would sit on a center pier in the middle of the river channel 
and then rotate like a uh, lazy Susan on these turntables uh, and uh, open and close uh, by, uh, by rotating on a horizontal axis uh, to then allow ships to pass on either side. And so you can see this is a, uh, a, uh, an image of one of the first Rush Street bridges and what that uh, would have looked like uh, in the 1860s. So uh, the, these uh, swing bridges then, uh, their demise was ushered in with the advent of cheap commercial steel and large ships coming into the Great Lakes. And so these ships demanded nearly the full river channel to come in and out of the Chicago River. Um, and uh, Chicago was one of the busiest riverways in the world. In 1887, it had 21,000 arrivals and departures in that year. And you can imagine, uh, like it is today, uh, that was compressed through uh, during the what they call the navigational period, where uh, basically about April uh, through uh, mid or late December uh, was when most of the ship traffic occurred, uh, so that uh, you could see where the bridges would be opening quite frequently, uh, as much as maybe two or three, maybe four times an hour. Uh, so they had this uh, idea of being, uh, you could get bridged, as they'd say in Chicago, and be late or miss a meeting. Uh, the, this image shows the inadequacy of the swing bridges, where these purple outlines here, the three there shown on the South Branch of the Chicago River, uh, near Taylor and 12th Street, which is now Roosevelt Road. And there had been three swing bridges uh, in secession in that area. And it would be impossible for these larger ships to get down to a lot of the industry on the South Branch of the Chicago River. And so the uh, Secretary of War is given the power to order the removal of these bridges. Uh, of course, Chicago was the one uh, that caused a lawsuit that went all the way to Supreme Court to uh, force then the sec a reluctant Secretary of War to use his powers to order the removal of these, what they called obstructions to navigation. So that left Chicago with having to figure out how do you create a bridge uh, that will uh, allow you to have almost the full channel or the entire channel of the river. And uh, I mentioned bascule before. Uh, bascule is a French word meaning seesaw um, or teeter-totter, and it usually involved the use of a counterweight and uh, so uh, that then allows this long arm over the waterway to be balanced against the short arm and the counterweight uh, to put that center of gravity very close to the pivot point of the bascule bridge. Uh, and bascule goes back to uh, early French word, uh, which may have originally meant to uh, fall on one's buttocks. So if you imagine, and can excuse my French, the counterweight as the ass end of the bridge, it falls down then uh, to open uh, the waterway for ships to pass through. Uh, so uh, it's a, the nice thing about this too is there is no patent on, on this. And uh, so it was public domain that then was a design that could be used by most anyone. Um, and then many different engineers would come in and design specific bridges as an approach to this. And where several were built in Chicago uh, and built here first. Uh, this one at uh, Canal Street was the second bridge at that location, and it was called a folding lift bridge, or later referred to as a jackknife bridge. Uh, this was uh, William Harmon, who was a Chicagoan and also head of the tugboat, uh, president of the tugboat uh, association, who came up with this design. So it would open um, uh, very much like a jackknife, uh, which, uh, a, a, and they had built one of these over at Weed Street. Um, connecting Goose Island with the north side. And uh, city inspectors and engineers and officials came to see that work in its first uh, opening or one of its early openings. And uh, the uh, city engineer explained uh, it best saying that in principle it seemed right, uh, but it needed some work. And apparently uh, later the locals, whenever that bridge would open or close in that uh, Goose Island area, would stand back for fear that uh, some shrapnel or part of the bridge would come flying off uh, when it went through its contortions, as the newspaper recounts uh, recalled. And it would uh, make a lot of grinding and screeching. It sounded like it needed some oil. Um, so that not being a great solution, 
uh, another experiment was tried, and that was a vertical lift bridge. And uh, although this was uh, not a new idea, it was a, a new design in that uh, this gentleman here with the mustache and the medals on his, uh, on his uh, jacket was J.A.L. Waddell, and this is his patent for the very first modern vertical lift bridge uh, that would have been constructed out of steel. Uh, and he had won a design contest at Duluth, Minnesota uh, to build one of these bridges. However, the Army Corps of Engineers and Secretary of War blocked the construction of that at the site in Duluth. And so Chicago seized the opportunity to construct that bridge um, at Halstead, uh, South Halstead Street across the South Branch of the Chicago River. This was the very first ever modern uh, vertical lift bridge. So that center pier open, moves up and down, just like an elevator. Um, you have concrete counterweights on the outside of these tall towers that are 255 feet. Uh, and then inside those little houses atop the bridge um, were the shivs or pulleys, which cables connecting to the counterweights, which are little squares um, on, on the, down near the bottom, uh, just above the roadway, um, would, the cables would go up over uh, those shivs and then connect to the four corners of that center pier or center draw of the bridge to raise and lower it uh, as a, just like an elevator to allow ships to pass. And this could open to as much as 155 feet, uh, allowing even sailing ships to pass through. Now, uh, the, the engineer in charge of, city engineer in Chicago, uh, John Erickson, uh, really didn't appreciate this bridge. He um, wrote some, uh, some complaints about it in some of the trade literature. And so the, the, it was a real setback for Waddell. Um, however, he partnered with another engineer uh, and uh, John Harrington and uh, modified and enhanced this uh, design. And there's still uh, many vertical lift bridges in Chicago. Uh, the most, the best known is this Pennsylvania Railroad and Amtrak bridge that is down in Chinatown crossing the south branch of the Chicago River. And uh, this bridge actually being built before 1911, it was built in uh, 1915 and is over 100 years old, um, has a very low clearance, only about 10 uh, feet or so. And so it has to open on demand unless, of course, the train is scheduled to cross. And you can see there's actually a tugboat here waiting uh, to have the bridge lift. Uh, and that probably lifts you know, uh, close to 100 times or more a year, letting ships pass back and forth and then is monitored by remote control and uh, operated uh, by remote uh, control, I think from a train switching station over at 14th Street and Lumber. Well, this being maligned by John Erickson and some of the other designers, uh, the next idea was the uh, folding lift, or the rolling lift bridge. And the very first of these in the world was built at Van Buren Street. Uh, there is a sister bridge uh, the open uh, bridge is the Van Buren Street. The one behind it is then uh, the Metropolitan, what, uh, the West Metropolitan Elevated Railroad uh, Bridge, uh, sister bridge. They were both built in uh, basically 1895 and lasted until the 1950s. Um, and they basically operated very similar to uh, a rocking chair. Um, there's still one of these left uh, in Chicago at Cermak Road or what used to be 22nd Street. And this bridge does still open in the spring and fall bridge lifts. And so, as I said, it kind of like a rocking chair, uh, this bridge will operate and roll on this curved segmental steel girder uh, and roll back or uh, up and away uh, from the waterway to open and close. Now, uh, John Erickson, who was also the city engineer during this experimental period of the early 1900s um, and late 1800s, didn't like this bridge either because it seemed to cause some problems in that that movement of the bridge uh, and the fact that it the whole bridge is resting on this curved uh, segmental steel girder. You can think the um, the surface area of that arc uh, was uh, would quickly deteriorate, and so that girder would would break down uh, fairly quickly. But worse yet was the foundations of these bridges did not go down to bedrock, which is a problem in Chicago because it's maybe 60 to 120 feet uh, below the surface of this soil and clay and gravelly soil that we have uh, left over from the Ice Age. 
And uh, so this bridge, when it went up and down, had a tendency to wag, which is one of the engineering terms that I kind of understood right away in that not quite as much as a dog's tail, but the wind pressures that would shift as this was open <coughs> would cause uh, the um, deterioration of that curved steel girder, but also it might make the foundations to move as much as an inch or two towards the center of the river um, a year. And so there was even a story where the State Street Bridge, which the one prior to our existing State Street Bridge, um, had to have several inches of steel shaved off the nose of it in order to get it to close properly. So this left Erickson after three different attempts, um, failing of other engineering designs, to do a literature search uh, within the um, North America and Europe. Uh, granted, he didn't have much of a budget, so he couldn't send his staff or go himself to other locations uh, to study bridges. So they looked at the literature and determined that the Tower Bridge in London, which is one of the world's uh, still most famous bascule bridges, um, was a grid designed for Chicago. And this is what's called a fixed trunnion bascule bridge. Uh, the unique idea about this is uh, it opens on a bascule principle, uh, but it has a, a fixed point of rotation, sort of like a, an old cannon. Uh, these, uh, this, this, this uh, knob or kind of round piece coming off the side of the cannon uh, um, then is what's called a trunnion. And so the cannon itself sits in this carriage and that allows you to adjust the altitude uh, of the cannon to uh, you know, fling or fire your, your cannon at different ranges uh, at, uh, to defend the keeper castle. Well, the bridge operates in the same fashion and, uh, and so that led to then Chicago's uh, own design, uh, which is the very first of these, and they are then later called a Chicago type or Chicago style basketball bridge, was at Cortland Street in uh, 1902. And we have um, now three of those remaining out of the 10 that were built between 1902 and 1911. And then these Chicago type bridges have also gone through their own iterations and evolutions. Uh, in that uh, looking at uh, these bridges here, the first generation, you can see these bridge houses are just sort of uh, stuck on the side. Although they're a cute little house, uh, they don't look like they're part of the rest of the bridge other than they're attached to it. Um, and even worse in the, in the case of this Division Street Bridge, which is now treated as a fixed bridge up on the North Branch. Well, um, Chicago's second generation type bridges uh, instead of having uh, the higher curved arc here and actually the, the gears uh, uh, are on the back side and they um, actually mesh uh, on this back end with what's called a pinion gear. And so that would drive the back end of the bridge down for it to bascule or fall down the back side and then open the waterway. Well, on the second generation bridges, they move that curve to the inside which meant for a lower superstructure uh, and also a little smaller footprint uh, that would make for a better bridge and now starting to maybe approach that Alexander III bridge that I talked about at the opening. And this is the Washington Street or Washington Boulevard bridge that was built in 1914, one of the early second generation bridges. And then we recently just lost the Chicago Avenue bridge, which was the first example of actually integrating these, the architecture of the bridge houses with the masonry and architecture of the bridge itself. And they had some unique oval uh, bridge houses. And there's now a Bailey Bridge at this location uh, that is an interim bridge until uh, the city gets funding from the uh, federal government and the state to uh, put in a more permanent uh, bridge. Uh, and it will be a fixed bridge because that north branch is no longer required to have drawbridges. Um, one of the other amazing evolutions was at Lake Street in 1916, and it used to have one of the old swing bridges that had been double decked to carry the L trains in and out of Chicago, in and out of the loop from the uh, west side into uh, downtown, and that needed to be replaced. Now, originally the city had plans to put a vertical lift bridge here, and uh, it was stopped by civic uh, uh, authorities or, or uh, civic groups and that city beautiful movement that I also mentioned at the outset 
that it would be an ugly, you can imagine having those huge steel towers on either shore at Lake Street. And so instead they came up with a double deck, double leaf bascule bridge. And it was the very first of its kind in the world. And in fact, there was a lawsuit from Scherzer Rolling Lift Bridge Company uh, that they had stolen one of their designs. It was in one of their 1918 catalogs and the city had to prove that it had uh, this idea much earlier than 1908. In any event, um, that's uh, one of the other evolutions. And what I also talk about when I do walking tours along the river of the bridges in Chicago, you can start to tell these different generation bridges or the era in which they're built by the architecture. Uh, as I mentioned with those first generation bridges, the <clears throat> uh, bridge house is sort of just tacked onto the side. Uh, but then when you get into the 20s um, and uh, the second generation bridges, you start to get this Beaux Arts influence um, and this is the LaSalle Street Bridge, which has four bridge houses. Um, only two are necessary to actually operate each half of the bridge. The other two are superfluous, which is a word I don't get to use very often, so I squeeze it in. And uh, this is a uh, highly, second most highly ornamented bridge in Chicago after the Michigan Avenue Bridge. Uh, and it also, uh, if you're on the north side, looking down LaSalle Street, the bridge nicely frames that shot down to the Board of Trade and the heart of the financial district. This is built in the Roaring Twenties at, at, at its height in 1928, uh, which might also explain the ornamentation. Uh, the other explanation is that William Bennett was a architect from the UK that was brought in by Daniel Burnham to help write the Burnham plan. He was then a consulting engineer, or consulting architect to the city uh, that then oversaw or influenced the bridge designs, overall designs, to try to improve their, their look and uh, try to accommodate that city beautiful movement. And so uh, this bridge was uh, one, of the, one of the best examples of that. And you can see this like massard roof, which basically means it's a four-sided roof or a tin-hipped roof, which is four-sided. It gives a much stronger, um, solid appeal. A lot of banks will have that look to make it look like a safe place to keep your money. That's, I'll leave that to you to, to whether or not to believe. And uh, the Massard roof then has multiple angles on the four sides of that roof, but it gives it a nice solid appearance. And then there's a lot of additional ornamentation on the bridge. Then uh, in the 1930s and 40s, you get into some of the Art Deco with the depression, you couldn't afford the ornamentation of the Beaux-Arts style. <clears throat> and you get the um, more austere Art Deco style, but has repeating geometric shapes along the design. And then also there are some nice raised um, uh, relief panels uh, out of stone or concrete, such as at the North Ashland Avenue Bridge or at State Street Bridge, which was uh, built in 1949. Uh, and then as the technology improved post-World War II, <coughs> excuse me, you could actually get away with one bridge house. And one of the first of these is at North Halstead Street, built in 1955 where you had the remote controls that you could control each leaf of the bridge. And then we have some more modern bridges, uh, one of these being the Columbus Drive Bridge. It was also uh, a prototype at the Loomis Street Bridge was the first of these. And then also Randolph Street, which was built in 1986. And these have what's called a, a welded box girder, which there are four of these. And this entire piece was fabricated in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then floated by barge and then assembled as the bridge, uh, into the bridge uh, when it was constructed in that upright position. Uh, so you did not interrupt the uh, right of way of the, of the waterway and, tr and boat traffic. Um, so uh, you know, there's really only one point of adjustment on this bridge and on either side. And when it was lowered for the first time nose to nose, it was off by less than an inch or about three centimeters. Uh, so, uh, pretty amazing technology in welding to be able to build something that carries a quarter block of traffic of six lanes across the river and then also um, uh, be that precise. I'm not sure I'd want to be the engineer in charge of that project. And uh, so then people will ask finally, what's the future of the bridges in Chicago? Um, my expectation is because of the federal legislation, the main and south branches will still experience the status quo of spring and fall bridge lifts. Um, there's going to be additional replacement of older north branch drawbridges as there's still a few left that are treated as fixed bridges. And I like to 
kind of end on the note of, you know, Chicago Hat is the greatest working drawbridge museum in the world. Uh, and some people say, well, where is that museum? And it's the bridges strung along the waterway like gems on a necklace. Uh, but uh, there's also a bridge house museum at the southwest corner of the Michigan Avenue Bridge that's run by Friends of the River. And you can get inside and actually see a bridge lift uh, on a Wednesday or Saturday morning in the spring and the fall. So I'll, uh, I'll kind of stop there and leave it open for questions. Um, Julie, you, what have you got? Great, thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. Um, maybe we could have you unshare screen. Sure. Um, and we can move into some questions. Um, that was actually, it was interesting to hear about the history of the Y of the Rivers because the Y of the Rivers is actually in the GSC's logo, so. Well, that's the municipal symbol for back, I think, to the 30s or, or maybe earlier. Absolutely, yeah. So thank you so much. Um, so we have a few questions from our audience and I want to let the audience know that if you have any more questions, please go ahead and drop them in the um, Q&A section. Um, for right now though, uh, our first question is, how many functional drawbridges are there in Chicago? So there's 37 and I mentioned that in the presentation. Um, it's a mixture of both uh, street bridges and railroad bridges on both the uh, Calumet River uh, and uh, the also then on the Santa Sierra Canal and on the Chicago River. Okay, very cool. Um, how many of the bridge houses are still occupied? Well, on, on the Chicago River, <coughs> uh, none of them are. And they basically used a, um, like a leapfrog or hopscotch method where on these bridge lift days on the Saturday mornings or Wednesday mornings, different crews will man multiple bridges and then they'll hopscotch each other to try to open one or more bridges at a time to keep the boats moving through and lessen the impact on downtown traffic. Now on the Calumet River, the drawbridges there, the bridge houses are, um, are manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week throughout the year. And that's really where the core of these bridge centers are trained and, and, and why we can continue to employ them. And there's basically about uh, 56 uh, bridge tenders or bridge operators as they prefer to be called uh, and uh, 56 to 48 depending on how you count supervisors. Um, uh, that's an, actually a neat piece in the documentary uh, uh, that we have on our DVD that we interviewed a couple of uh, bridge tenders and uh, it was pretty fascinating to talk to them. Uh, you would ask them about their job and they'd kind of light up um, of of just that excitement of opening a bridge. It, it apparently still doesn't get old after doing it thousands of times. <laughs> uh, that you're, you know, you're, it's like you're playing with heavy equipment and a big Tonka truck or Tonka toy to open and close these bridges. And they explained how each bridge has its own personality. So when they're on those crews um, and going from bridge to bridge, there's little nuances to each bridge given that they were built in different eras and the equipment might be slightly different. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think a good follow-up question to that would be, what is your favorite bridge and why? Um, well, my favorite bridge is very obscure. Um, so my usual answer to this is the Kinsey Street bridges, which is, gives me a two for one because there's both the railroad bridge there and the street bridge. And that's where I got the idea to really do this research and, and dig into uh, the bridges. I mean, it was an eight year project to get the book done. Uh, which came out uh, in, 18, or in 2013. And, and actually, I, I guess I, I had some satisfaction that it won three, three different awards. Um, so not bad for a first effort, but uh, I, I seem to have this terrible penchant for long, long drawn out projects. And I'm not sure that's not, definitely not profitable. I was told at the beginning, <laughs> writing a regional history book is no way to get rich. And that's definitely proven true. And I think <laughs> kids' books aren't much better, so. <laughs> But uh, three awards for a first go around is uh, awesome, <laughs> really good. Um, another question we have here is, are the bridges uh, difficult to maintain since they're so old? Uh, I, I think it, from what I understand and talking to Grant Crowley, who um, runs Crowley's Boatyard, which used to be on the South Branch until about 2004, and now they're down on the Calumet uh, near 95th Street. Um, 
he met, noticed that the bridges tend to take a lot more maintenance now than they used to because they don't get as much use. Um, and so, because uh, now with the fewer boats going through, because uh, Crowley's took about 800 boats that used to be on the South Branch and would require, I don't know, some 20 or more bridges to get to the lake, um, out of that group of boats that go through the river, and they're now down on the Calumet. You can accommodate over a thousand boats down there. Um, so the lifts aren't as frequent. And it, it used to be the bridges would open on demand up until about 1995 uh, when they codified this coordination between the boat yards and the city so that they could kind of get boats to cluster together and just do the lifts on the Wednesdays and Saturdays or if they needed Sunday mornings. Um, where they, when they were on demand, then there was somebody in the bridges all the time and the maintenance was a little more routine. Uh, but of course, you know, a, a, a drawbridge is, is a pretty expensive to maintain, particularly since a lot of the gears and components, if we ever had to replace them, um, we don't really have the manufacturing technology to do that like we did in say the 40s or 50s uh, or 60s even, um, as a lot of the machining tool and die uh, steel making and that has moved offshore. Um, so there's about a $10 million budget or more for the city to maintain the bridges, uh, but that's not just the draw bridges. It also includes a lot of the Oda River passes and it's a total of about 277 bridges. Uh, so that, that 10 million doesn't go very far. However, in the last 20 years, they've done a really good job of repainting at least four bridges a year and, um, and the uh, maintaining this heritage of these bridges because they've been recognized internationally in engineering and architectural circles as, as real gems. And a few of them are actually land, Chicago landmarked. Oh, wow. Um, so the next question we have here is, what kind of considerations are made in making bridges uh, walkable or bikeable? Um, well, the... Um, the bridges themselves uh, often since World War II have had that expanded steel grating uh, for the bridge decks. Um, that replaced what would have been maybe wood and tar or some kind of asphalt. Um, the city really struggled to find the ideal surface that would hold up to automobile traffic as it increased and got heavier and bigger cars and trucks. Um, and that expanded steel works well, except if you're kind of walking or biking across and so one of the um, solutions has been, uh, they will sometimes fill that grating with concrete, um, but that adds a lot of weight to the bridge. So oftentimes you'll see that only on the approaches where it adds to the counterweight, but then doesn't have to be counteracted uh, if it's out on the long arm of the, the, the drawbridge. Um, so instead they've taken and done these composite tiles oftentimes on the sides, like say at Wells Street, um, which is a, has a bike lane and they've got, they've then kind of basically tiled this uh, with this composite, I don't know if it's like a plastic or, or uh, of some sort that's, you know, a few, maybe less than an inch thin, but then your, uh, the bikes go through uh, or across the bridge much better, uh, particularly if you're in a narrow tired bike than on the steel grating or especially when it's wet. And I, there was a woman that I met actually who, who did a lot of lobbying for the city who had had an accident crossing one of the bridges and was instrumental in getting those added to most of the bridges where there was, especially where there was heavy bike traffic. And I, I can't recall her name on me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this next uh, question is preceded by a comment. So these older bridges look very heavy duty. Are there any catastrophic failures associated with these bridges due to engineering or design failures? Um, not engineering design failures so much. Um, I, well, there's a couple of stories in my book and I, I, there's so well, there's about a half different dozen examples um, of where we've had some kind of a problem, but the most dramatic is probably at the Michigan Avenue bridge um, in 1992. Uh, and that bridge is actually two side-by-side -side draw bridges, um, double leaf, uh, double deck bridges, and it's split down the middle. Um, so they're carrying uh, six lanes of traffic on the top and four lanes on the bottom with pedestrians on the side and being split down the middle they could then take part of it out of service uh, while they still run traffic back and forth on on say the the northbound lanes instead of the south and the southbound lanes are being uh, repaired. Well they had parked a 
a crane on that one half of the bridge that was being worked on. And uh, there's some, uh, they think that maybe either the heel locks in the back of the bridge were not fully set. There might have been some vibration um, from some of the bridge lifts uh, earlier in the, uh, early in the weekend. But on a Saturday, Sunday morning, uh, that, that crane sitting on the back end of the bridge acted like a huge counterweight. And one part of the, one part of the bridge flipped up like a huge catapult uh, and then crashed down into the counterweight pit, uh, which is uh, the approach of the bridge, under the approach of the bridge. Uh, and through a whole bunch of uh, debris that was uh, there for the repair work, um, over on the Wacker Drive, it broke windows and some buses that were parked there. Um, but most interesting was the steel ball that was on the crane was whipped over, hit Wacker Drive, and then bounced and landed in the back of a Ford Escort. Totaled the car. In the passenger seat was one of the workers who was either on break or getting ready to come to work uh, on that Saturday, Sunday morning, who got out of the car unscathed as it landed on the back half of the car uh, and was, uh, I guess, quite shaken up, but okay. And I like to think that somebody was looking out for him and uh, ironically, his first name was Jesus. There you go. Wow, that is a miracle story. Um, <laughs> and there's a few other incidents like that that I talk about in the book. We have a comment um, from someone in the chat that says, uh, the person who pushed for plates on bridge decks to protect cyclists is Kathy Schubert. At oh, CDOT, we called them the Kathy plates in her honor. And I've met her a couple times. She's come to some of my talks. Um, our next question is, um, uh, did the Chicago fire affect how the bridges were built? Uh, definitely. Um, in the Chicago Fire of 1871, uh, eight drawbridges were, were destroyed in that fire between uh, August 8th and, 8th, uh, and August 10th of 1871. And uh, most of the bridges at that point were wood or wood and iron. Uh, and so after that, then all iron bridges were preferred. And then eventually in the late 1880s, early 1890s, we went to, to steel bridges, and now all the bridges are uh, entirely steel. So that, that fire definitely did make a preference. The interesting thing was, here was uh, a third of the, the city was homeless. Um, several acres of the downtown north and, and west sides, or south and west sides had been destroyed, and yet money was set aside right away to replace the bridges to reconnect Chicago. So. Uh, I thought that was pretty amazing, and all eight of those bridges were were rebuilt uh, by uh, 1872. Wow, that's impressive. Um, this is a logistical question. Um, has an updated river bridge lift schedule been announced yet? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I I can uh, I'll I'll have to I'll have to I'll have to see. Um, but sometimes the city department of transportation will have that as a um, a press release on the city website. Um, but I don't have my I don't I don't know offhand. Now I know they've been doing lifts though for several weeks because people could stage boats in the harbors prior to their opening on Monday. Um, so I think they still have kept that um, Wednesday and Saturday morning schedule, which is, is, is in the legislation or, or the, the federal uh, regulations. And um, so those will usually, those will usually would go to about um, mid-June or end of June, uh, given the late, the season being pushed back with, uh, with COVID and the, the lockdown, uh, I would guess that that would probably go into July at least. Um, so, uh, yeah, you try to take a look at the city and see if that is on CDOT, Chicago Department of Transportation uh, website. Great. Um, this is a follow up on what we were just talking about. Uh, how many people have been killed uh, during construction and operation of the bridges? Well, I, I don't have a total number on that. Uh, I, I, um, there was an, an occasional uh, death in some of the construction 
but that wasn't highly publicized. Most of my, a lot of the good source for this was the Chicago Tribune archives, which you can get to with a Chicago Public Library um, card, and you can do that online and search all the way back to the 19, 1860s. Um, there were a few incidences of people in either cars or cabs that got caught halfway on and halfway off a bridge. That happened um, at Well Street at one time and then twice at Kinsey Street. And um, there was a, I know a cab driver was killed in one case and some people were flipped upside down or shaken up uh, in some other cases. Uh, so I, again, there's a, there's a couple of those in my book, um, but overall total, I, I don't know. That's a good question. That, that would take quite a lot of digging to come up Absolutely. with. I, I spent a lot of time on it already. I didn't, that one didn't come up. Yeah. Um, our next question is, what do you make of the use of the bridges in recent weeks to corral protesters and deny access to the loop? Was there any kind of intention in the creation of these bridges for this purpose? Uh, you know, there, there wasn't, I mean, there's two situations where the bridges um, that were, would effectively do that. Um, and there's, if you go back to the uh, Lager Beer Riots of 1855, which is Chicago's first civil disobedience uh, event, uh, they actually did raise the, or uh, sorry, they didn't raise it because it was a swing bridge at that point. They rotated or opened the Clark Street Bridge to stop a mob from the north side that were protesting their, the, the greater restrictions on uh, beer li or licenses, tavern licenses. Uh, that was part of this Know Nothing or American Nativist movement uh, against the uh, immigrant groups, which were mostly German or Irish at that time, but a mixture. And so they did swing the bridge to stop the crowd and give the police time to, to get in place. Um, and then, uh, let's see, also, you know, there was, as I mentioned before, that idea of with the river being, uh, the bridge is opening on demand, uh, people would get what they called bridged and stuck. And so there was even a play where uh, a woman was gonna get married from, uh, had two suitors, one on the south side, one on the west side. And they would have, at a certain time and date, whoever got there first, she would marry. And of course they both got stuck uh, with an open bridge and had to figure out how to, how to get there to win her hand in marriage. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, and, and the, so, so really, uh, the drawbridges, the idea of the Basco bridges was that it would provide a, a barrier to vehicles or horse and wagon going into the river when the bridge is open, which happened frequently, uh, when the, uh, swing bridges were in place. Um, but, if you go back to the traditional use of a drawbridge, that is to protect a castle or keep. And so it did make sense for the mayor to uh, sever a lot of the transportation connections into the loop to protect city hall or downtown <clears throat> business district by raising the bridges. Uh, I, I was tempted to go down there at the time, but thought, you know, I was, I was still recovering a little bit from having a bit of a virus myself and, uh, was not feeling that ambitious to go down and, but I would have loved to have gotten some pictures of all the bridges up because uh, that hasn't happened for a long time, probably since they did the United Airlines or American Airlines uh, commercial back in, I think it was in the 90s when they had the, showed, had a shot of the bridges almost all up. Very interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question is, uh, do you have any insights about the overall budget the city spends uh, annually uh, for each decade um, or for each decade in upkeeping these bridges? Uh, and are there any counter arguments in terms of justification for their maintenance? Um, I mean, the, um, the, 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 the figure I got a couple of years ago from CDOT was that they have about a $10 million budget, but that's maintaining 277 bridges, the drawbridges being part of that. Um, I mean, I think the, the reason that I think their bridges are so uh, amazing and interesting is this rich history that Chicago has for drawbridge development. It's really part of our industrial heritage. Um, there's a lot of architecture and uh, construction and engineering groups that have recognized the bridges and will come to do conferences in Chicago specifically because of the bridges. And I've done tours for them when they come down, come into there to do those conferences since the books come out. Um, 
So I think they're an important historic aspect, but you know, there's the other argument of nobody wants to pay for history, um, which, you know, hence a writing a regional history book is no way to get rich. But, uh, and I'm torn because for instance, at North Avenue, uh, that used to be one of the first generation drawbridges similar to the one at Cortland Street that I showed on the presentation. Uh, it was a double leaf, uh, first generation bridges with the big curved uh, ends. And uh, that was replaced then in 2004 with a, uh, instead of a two lane bridge, a, a four lane fixed bridge. Now the city did a nice job and it was the first suspension bridge in Chicago and it's a, a attractive bridge but not nearly as interesting or exciting as a bridge that would actually move or open um, to, um, to the real bridge fans. But yet when I'm driving around in that neighborhood, which is already congested on that, you know, Clybourne corridor, uh, I'm glad to have at least the four lane skin. And it was really tough to get through there and cross the river when it was only the two lane uh, drawbridge. So it's, it's, a, it's always a trade off. And in the United States, we tend to tear things down rather than, preserve and, uh, and, and keep a lot of our industrial heritage. Uh, so I guess that's the caution to, um, you know, replacement of, of these bridges. And the reason they don't get replaced uh, right away, because the city would probably love to get rid of the, the, the lifts, um, is that, you know, we have federal law that also requires uh, and has oversight of the city bridges uh, and the waterways in Chicago. Uh, that are used, uh, that are considered navigate, navigationable. And it was important in World War II also because we were able to then leverage Great Lakes shipbuilding uh, that was very strong at that time uh, to then get warships down to the Gulf of Mexico, which was a little safer than being on the East Coast, uh, even though there were submarines in both the Gulf and, uh, and the Atlantic that could destroy Chicago or shipping from the Great Shipping our new ships that were built for World War II. Thank you. Um, we just have uh, one or two more questions here. Um, are there any drawbridges that may be closed due to age or safety concerns in the near future? Um, I know they do every two years a full engineering review of the bridges. Uh, and then they do have, I think, four or five categories that they end up doing a one to 10 ranking. Um, <clears throat> if that total score gets uh, to uh, four or below, then there's a serious structural issue that needs to be taken care of and addressed. And that did happen with the East Division Street Bridge um, in, uh, I think it was 2014 or 2015, where uh, the bridge had uh, started to deteriorate. It was one of the very first generation drawbridges. Uh, it was over 100, it was 111 years old. And although they had redecked it within the last decade, it needed to be uh, seriously repaired or replaced. And so they got emergency approval to be able to remove it uh, and uh, replace it now with a Bailey Bridge, which is an interim bridge, until they're eventually gonna, I think, replace both Division Street bridges with two brand new fixed bridges um, that would also be probably four lanes wide rather than two lanes that are there. Um, so that does happen. It's unusual, um, and uh, the city, I think, is, is quite aware of the bridges and has been pretty good about keeping maintenance. Um, I actually was interviewed on Chicago Tonight a couple of years ago when we had a series of bridges turning 100 years old, uh, and I knew they were going to ask that question, so I talked to uh, the commissioner, one of the deputy commissioners of CDOT, and he assured me that our, our drawbridges are safe uh, and that we have this general review and upkeep uh, and because they've been uh, recognized, uh, I think we're also maintaining that, that industrial heritage reasonably well. I mean, it could always be more, it could always be better. Um, Our last question for you today is, can we book a tour with you to see these drawbridges? Um, yes, I mean, I will do walking tours by appointment. Uh, and I've also done a couple tours where I've tag teamed with Liz Garibay and it's a um, uh, under the bridge fluence tour, which we uh, stop at a few taverns and talk both Chicago history and some bridge history um, uh, with, uh, with some drinks involved. Although Liz and I don't drink till the end, so we can you know, still explain what we're seeing, what everybody's seeing. Uh, hopefully we'll get that, that revived. But in the meantime, if somebody wants to contact me 
directly. I'm happy to take small groups uh, on tours and have done that uh, on and off over the, over, over the years. Um, I don't have anything formally scheduled at this point, um, but yes, happy, happy to do a small group or you know, anywhere from 10 to, to uh, 20 people is good. And I usually charge about 15 bucks a person. So it's uh, pretty reasonable for about a 90 minute tour. Great. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, we really appreciate you presenting today. Uh, and that will conclude our travelogue presentation today. So thank you so much to all for attending and for supporting the work of the Ge Geographic Society of Chicago. Um, for information on future travelogues or on how to become a member of the GSC, please visit us at our website, um, www.geographicsociety.org. Our next travelogue will be on the Eastern Seaboard of the United States on July 15th at 1 p.m. Um, so we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.